Good morning. It's good to see you. Welcome to the House of the Lord this morning. I was in um, Gulston on Sea um, on Wednesday morning and I was walking up the high street and I spotted a shop called Heaven. Now I've never seen a shop called Heaven before and it took me a little bit by surprise. Um, I'm not quite sure what it sold, sort of curiosities, possibly antiques, I don't know, but uh, I was on the wrong side of the street to see properly. But I thought, oh, I wonder if that's what, uh, you know, that, they obviously had this idea of treasure in heaven, I don't know. But I'm sure that's not what Jesus was thinking of when he talked about storing up treasures in heaven, a shop on mm -hmm. a high street. So uh, it did get me thinking about what does it mean to store up treasure in heaven? So I'm going to look at that in a bit more detail a little later on this morning. We're going to begin though with song number 18. sit down and think about all his provision for us each and every day. We're going to uh, just change the mood of the meeting a little bit and uh, enter into a time of prayer just now. We're going to use song number 596 to do that and we're going to use the tune of 
Randolph. You'll be um, you'll recognise the tune of Randolph, so uh, there won't be any issues there. The words, though, you might not be familiar with. Jesus, all atoning now, thine and only thine I am. Take my body, spirit, soul. Only thou possess the whole. Beautiful words of Charles Wesley. Sometimes you know we we want to give God. You know our all but we don't actually give him our all if you know what i mean but uh, this song does say about that the fourth verse in particular is the verse that i chose the reason i chose this song all my treasure is above all my riches is thy love who the worth of love can tell infinite unsearchable let's sing these words together just now how to love ourselves as you love us. We forget how to love our neighbours as Christ loves us. We forget to recognise the needs of those around us because we're too busy with our own daily worries. We fret, we doubt, our thoughts spin and sometimes we become absorbed in ourselves. We long to fully abide in your love, Lord. Forgive us when we falter in that. But there's times too when we abandon our gladness and instead we despair. We hear the stories of abuse, abandonment, the realities of oppression and violence. Sometimes we hear so much bad news we become desensitised to it. We turn away from the harsh realities and neglect our neighbour. Lord, we long to offer a helping hand, to love and serve you with gladness. So forgive us, Lord, when we fall to in doing that. Father, as we've already been reminded in song, you have given us the gift of this world. We have fresh air, green spaces to grow food, waterways and oceans that fill the earth with water. And yet there are times when we waste our resources. There's times when we ignore the needs of the planet, putting our desires above our call to care for creation. Help us return our hearts to the rhythms and needs of your creation, Lord. Lord, you've created the light, the dark and the hues in between. You make all things beautiful. And yet we often ascribe greater meaning to the light the darkness, or the hues in between. We judge the beauty and worth of others. We lose sight of the light of Christ in each one of us. We forget the dark 
is the space where life begins. We judge skin tone, the skin tone of others, and describe worth, not by your means, but by our own. We're inconsistent in our approach, but how we honour you, how we honour who you have created. Forgive us when we fall to in this, Lord. Amen. Lord, may you bless this time that we share together this morning. May your name be honoured, and may each person that's gathered here receive a blessing from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. 
Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Well, may God give us understanding to the reading of his word this morning. In the days of the Wild West, there was, an, there was a bank robbery in California, and it involved a large sum of money. The bank hired a bounty hunter to track down the thief. And when the search led to Mexico, he realized he needed to hire an interpreter. One was found, and the bounty hunter promised a handsome reward if they recovered the money. The robber was eventually captured at gunpoint, and the bounty hunter asked through the interpreter where the money was hidden. The thief replied in Spanish that he had no idea of uh, what they were talking about. But having solid evidence of his guilt, the bounty hunter said to the interpreter, tell him if he doesn't tell me where the money is, I'll blow his head off. I'm not bluffing. Believing him, the robber told the interpreter exactly where it was hidden. What did he say? The bounty asked, hunter asked. Well, after a moment's hesitation, the interpreter answered, Senor, he says he's ready to, do, to die like a man. Think about that for a moment. The story is, of course, fictitious, but the sin of greed is every bit as deadly. Banks, corporations, the wealthy, and those in power often choose selfish gain over the good of others. Income inequality has skyrocketed in the past several decades. And with it, an unsustainable level of social injustice. The top 1% of households, and I'm assuming this is worldwide, rather than, um, say, Europe or America or whatever, now own more than 90% of all wealth. 1% of, you know, households own more than 90%, sorry, more than 90, I'll get it right in a minute, 1% of households that own more wealth than the bottom 90% combined. That's what I wanted to say. Okay. I want you to let that sink in for a moment. And wonder, how has that come to be? Well, the answer is simple. Greed. The cause of untold suffering and oppression in the world. Greed is defined as the selfish desire for more of something than is needed to the detriment of another. Now the last bit of that definition is crucial to understanding what greed is all about, to the detriment of another. When we selfishly acquire and amass more money or luxuries than we need, it almost always comes at the expense of others. In this account, Jesus was approached by a man with a complaint about his brother keeping the family inheritance for himself, which given all the news that, about inheritance tax and what might be happening to that, seems quite apt to talk about this at this time. Uh, the oldest son, he was already given a double share under Jewish law, but he wanted to keep all of it. And disputes of this kind, they were normally settled by rabbis. But rather than acting as a judge in personal disputes, Jesus wanted to use the opportunity to warn against the spiritual danger of greed for any of us. In his parable, a rich man chose to hoard his good crop so that he could live in selfish comfort rather than caring about his neighbour. But that very night his life was required of him by God, and his greediness was suddenly exposed to the sin it was. By failing to share his blessings, he'd missed the spiritual value 
of generosity. I think we all know that John Wesley um, was, with his brother Charles, founded the Methodist movement. But not many people probably realise that John Wesley also earned a fortune from all of his writings. He, he was at one time one of England's wealthiest men. And throughout his life, he lived on the same modest income and gave away all the rest. He had the equivalent of about 36 million pounds in today's currency. But he invested his wealth, not in personal comforts and luxuries, but in the cause of God's church and advancing his kingdom. He very wisely used it all for the sake of love. And Jesus spoke of this as storing up our treasures in heaven. I love the idea that in the next life, we'll see all the good our giving has done, the fruits of our generosity, whether person to person or charitable giving, and the blessing it's been to others. It's a beautiful thought when you think about it and an inspiration to share more of our worldly riches with those who are in need. Greed and generosity, they're opposing spiritual forces. Selfishness and greed, they have the effect of uh, shriveling our souls, if you like, by wasting our potential for love. Whereas generosity becomes the source of God's richest blessing and joy. He wants us to live as instruments of his love and goodness towards others. And just as it pleases parents to see their young children sharing something of theirs with another child, it greatly pleases God when we share the blessings that he's given us. God honours and rewards generosity. It's one of the most important spiritual laws of the kingdom. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 1 says this, Cast your bread on the waters, for you shall find it again after many days. Jesus said something very similar when he taught, Give and it shall be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And you can read those words in Luke chapter 6. I'm going to give you an example, actually, of, of those words. It's found in a story of two young men, and this is another one of these American stories, unfortunately. But it's a useful story. These two young men, they were students at Stanford University in 1891. And with their funds desperately low, they had the inspiration to invite the world-famous concert pianist, Ignacy Paderewski. And if I pronounce that wrong, you can tell me afterwards. Um, to perform on campus. Their idea was to devote all the costs, or profits I should say, from the ticket sales to their tuition fees. Paderewski's manager had asked for a guarantee of $2,000, which they had agreed to pay. Yet in spite of their hard work in promoting and staging the concert, they only managed to raise $1,600. And afterwards, they told Paderewski that they'd come up short, but they gave him the entire $1,600 anyway, along with a promissory note for the remaining $400, assuring him they would send that amount as soon as possible, and they hoped that he would accept the offer. No, that won't do at all, Paderewski replied, and their hearts sank. Then, tearing up the promissory note, he returned the money and said, now, take out of this 1600 all of your expenses, and each of you keep 10% of the balance for your work. Then you can give me the rest. His kindness and generosity meant they could remain in school, in college. Well, they graduated, and they went on to their own successful careers. 20 years later, the First World War broke out, and... Uh, Ignacy Paderewski, he was now Poland's Prime Minister. 
And he was at a loss over how to feed his starving people. Now for him, there was only one person who could really help out, and that was Herbert Hoover, the genius of logistical supply, who was organising um, food and humanitarian relief to post-war Europe. So thanks to Hoover at the time, thousands of tons of food began flowing into Poland. And deeply grateful, Paderewski travelled to Paris to thank him personally for saving the lives of his countrymen. I was glad to do it, Mr. Paderewski, Hoover said. Besides, you don't remember me, do you? But you helped me once when I was a college student in need myself. Now think about it for a moment. Paderewski hadn't shown, if Paderewski hadn't shown such generosity, um, Hoover would most likely have had to have left school and would never have been in the position to help Poland or the rest of Europe as he did. That single act of generosity made an enormous difference for the greater good of the world. And you know, every generous act has its own potential to help others, as we all know from personal experience, in ways both great and small. In the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus taught us not to hoard our treasure here on earth, but to invest it in heaven. He said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's important to realise that earthly treasure really is only temporary. But whatever we share with others for the sake of love, it remains. And it'll be a blessing not just to others, but also to ourselves. Right. John D. Rockefeller, he was the uh, founder of Standard Oil. He was an ambitious, hard nosed tycoon, whose only concern was acquiring even greater wealth. At the age of 53, he fell severely ill. He lost his hair and he was unable to digest food. He became deeply depressed and was given only a year to live. One night, struggling to sleep, he realised that he'd missed the real value of his fortune. Millionaires seldom smile, as Andrew Carnegie once famously observed, and Rockefeller's greed had only made him miserable. So he awoke the next morning with a new mission, to use his vast wealth to make a difference for good. And he gave away hundreds of millions to hospitals and universities, medical research, his church and missions, and his funds helped to discover the cure for a host <coughs> of diseases. As a result, he lived to the age of 98. His life was saved when he stopped focusing on himself and began to care more for others. Well, now that's a dramatic example. But we're all given our own opportunity to share with others in ways that will make a difference for the greater good, the advancement of the kingdom of God, and to the benefit of our own souls. So let's recognize the sin of greed for the evil curse it is, and instead choose to live in the rich blessing of generosity. One of God's paradoxical gifts, if you like. Because by giving our lives away for Christ, for Christ's sake, we find them. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, help us to give the gift of ourselves not just our things. Help us to open our hearts and minds to those who need us most, without fear or hesitation, so we may have the life you want for us, and others see you in the way we live. Amen. We're going to sing again just now, and it's song number 623.
be our experience and our testimony today. We're going to finish with um, a lively song, I think, to, uh, to end our worship with. Well, it's lively, and that's song we've just sung, but um, that's beside the point. It's song number 597. 